Good evening and welcome to TL Physics and today I'm going to talk about how to find the atomic radius using electron diffraction. So this relies on understanding about de Broglie and this was something that came around when we found the electron and of course de Broglie in the 1930s was able to realise that electrons if they go through some material would force a diffraction pattern. So this idea that I could have an atom with these dense nucleus and have atoms like this here. If electrons went through them, okay, they acted like a wave. And this wave would diffract. And I can actually measure so this electron would come through here, okay, and it, this electron would have a wavelength that would split up between here and this gap here and would cause an interference pattern. You would get superposition. And what's actually quite interesting about this is looking at the formula that relates with this, okay? So you've got this idea that there's the nucleus, this is the whole atom, there's the nucleus. So the distance of the gap, the, the slit spacing they're going through, is two lots of the radius, okay? As you can see here, if you look at the atom here, this is the gap it's going through, and of course, there's a region of empty space here. So it's literally going between here and here. And these points here where the nucleus is, this is the uh, distance it's going through. So if I shone my electron through with a speed, it would have a wavelength. And that is according to de Broglie. This is wave particle duality. The idea that uh, everything has a wave okay, when it's travelling. And the formula for de Broglie is that the wavelength is Planck's constant over m times velocity. So we get these high energy electrons, we fly them through, okay, and they will go and they will diffract. And they will cause a diffraction pattern. And I can measure this diffraction pattern, so what will end up here is I'll have a central maxima here, and as I, the angle goes down, I'll get these parts of bright and dark and bright and dark, or maxima and minima. And I can plot this on a graph that looks like this. Okay, so I can plot this on a graph, but this is the intensity versus the angle that this angle is at here. And I'd get a really bright bit, and then a dark bit, and then a bright bit, and then a dark bit again. Now, <coughs> what the electron's actually going through is a diffraction grating. So I'm going to bring up the diffraction grating formula of d sine theta equals n lambda. Okay, and what I'm actually interested in is one of the things that's really important is that when I'm looking at these, it's much easier to notice the minimum than it is the maximum value. And this is true for a lot of things. If you think about it, it's much easier to notice the change in light when it goes darker than when it gets brighter. Think about in your room or if you've turned a light on, it's much easier to detect the absence of light than it is to detect light because you have all this ambience. And so this distance here, of course, is 2R here. And so if I put this into the formula, if I was looking at whatever, if like we normally look at maximums, don't we? So we would have 2R sine theta equals n. Now, because it's a curve, it's going to be 1.22 lambda here, okay? And what I'm actually doing is I'm actually looking for the radius of the atom. So I'm actually going to divide everything by 2. So r sine theta equals 0.61 lambda. So instead of actually looking for the maxima, I'm actually looking for the minima. And that's what my angle is going to be here. Now, in an exam, you will have to be given this formula. This is not on any data sheet, okay? Um, you will have to be given this formula. The things that you would need to be aware of is that this is theta min, and of course, it's this the angle you're going to be taking from here. So let's say this is 44 degrees, okay? Let's say... Let's do an example of how we could find the atomic ratio um, thing. Let's, let's say that my electron has been fired with 
42, no, let's say 4.2 mega electron volts worth of energy. Okay, I need to find its wavelength, so I need to find its velocity. So this is kinetic energy, so I'm going to, of course, convert this into joules. So 4.2 times 10 to the 6 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. And that equals, so 4.2 times 10 to the 6 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 is going to be 6.72 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. So that's how many joules I have of kinetic energy. So that equals a half mv squared. So I'm going to times that by 2. I'm going to divide it by the mass of an electron. So that's 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31. And I end up with v squared is 1.4 8 times 10 to the 18, and I'm going to square root that, and I get an answer of ooh, V <coughs> is 1.2 times 10 to the 9 metres per second. I am aware this is breaking the laws of physics, but I randomly was just plucking numbers out of my head. Okay, but I'm going to go with it and see what result we get for this, okay? So I do apologise for that, uh, that is breaking, slightly breaking the laws of physics, but I'm going to keep with this number anyway. So we're going to find out this lambda here using the information I have here. So 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34, okay, um, times by 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31, times by 1.2 times 10 to the 9. So 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31. And then 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 divided by that is 5.99 times 10 to the minus 13 metres. Okay. And now I can use this wavelength in this formula here. Okay. So 0.61 times by 5.99 times 10 to the minus 13 equals R sine theta min, which I said here was 44 degrees. So R equals this divided by sine 44 times by 0.61 divided by sine 44. <coughs> and I get an answer of 5.26 times 10 to the minus 13 meters. Okay, this is much bigger than I was expecting, but I'm just trying to show you how you can use your values here. So the important thing to understand here is how this came about and why it was so useful. So Thomson found the electron, and this idea of electron diffraction came from de Broglie. And finding de Broglie's wavelength is a really useful way of using this. So you will be expected to use de Broglie. This is first year knowledge in a second year paper. This equation would have to be given to you and it may be given to you as the diameter is 1.22 rather than the radius but the important thing here is what you're looking at is this theta min so you're looking at the minimum theta that you are after, you are after the radius here so theta min which will be here about 44 okay so you may be given a graph of data to interpret and you need to find this little dip here and plug it into this formula you may be asked to find the de Broglie wavelength of a particle. And from that, you might be able to find the radius. The reason this is such a good method is because as you add more neutrons, the electrons, the gap would change. So the gap would get larger if you added more electrons. And this, in turn, would change the radius. Okay? So you would see more or less diffraction. This is why this is a much better method than the closest approach. Because the closest approach only was concerned about charged particles, not about the neutrons. This one is actually looking at the char the actual particle themselves, the, the atom itself, the nucleus. And as you add more neutrons, you actually affect the distance between them. And so everything, everything affected the electron diffraction here, which is why this was a far better method. From this, we were able to garner information about the radius of atoms 
and then plot a relationship between the atomic mass number, so the total amount of protons and neutrons, to the radius that we were able to calculate. And that would be in my next video about atomic radius.